Hello, everybody. Um, this is Luis Escobar again. And today, I want to discuss with you uh, some features of model design in ecological niche modeling for disease mapping. Um, so I, first, I want to summarize the steps or the ingredients that we need to make ecological niche modeling happen. Uh, first, we need a series of records of where the disease is happening, maybe um, outbreak in animals, in humans, in fish. Uh, we need to identify the, that the pathogen is there. We can have data from passive surveillance, which means that the data is coming uh, before us, like looking for the data. So there is an outbreak, and so, so we go and we get the data or from active surveillance, which means that maybe there is no outbreak, but we go and we take samples of serology, and we capture mosquitoes, and we capture wildlife to see what's going on, and if there are some pathogens circulating in the wildlife. Uh, we also need the environmental variables to have an understanding of the environmental conditions where our cases are happening. In this case, I have a series of of environmental variables that uh, may be related to the biology of my infectious disease. A very important step then is to clean the data. So I clean all my points or my records, my geographic coordinates. I, I, I remove any errors. And then I do the same with the environmental variables. Maybe I don't need all of them. Maybe I just need a subset. So I... Uh, remove correlation, I remove uh, the num I reduce the number, uh, and there are some techniques to do that, uh, but less variables, the better, so we don't have uh, a very complex model. And then we run the analysis using an, a, an a statistical or mathematical algorithm uh, in which we, using the points that you can see here inside, we um, try to reconstruct the ecological niche of my pathogen or my vector or my reservoir to identify those consistent environmental conditions where we have transmission. And then we project that model in geo in, in, to the geography to have the maps of potential transmission. So these are basically the steps that we're going to uh, need to develop the uh, disease maps. And something I would like to highlight here is that we need to be very careful in how we develop these models because in the past there have been some uh, exercises where we just put the data, click, 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 and, and we make the, the software run the analysis and we have the map and we make some inferences, but it could be dangerous if we are working with phyloviruses or rhabdoviruses on any pathogens that may be of high consequence for public health. So actually, the, this article is very interesting because it's a warning in how we should think carefully before we develop this analysis and how we need to design the protocols to develop uh, robust ecological niche models. The traditional um, framework uh, in niche modeling in order of relevance, I think, is working on the occurrence data, uh, just having points in a map, points from different sources, maybe doing field work, then having the environmental data, generally using climatic data, and then using an algorithm uh, hopefully an algorithm, an algorithm that is broadly used, so we don't need to justify why that algorithm and using the full parameters. That was the traditional way to do ecological niche models um, with a very poor study design, just using the data available and trying to do model interpretations in general based on a hunch. So now, what we're going to learn in this course is that it's more complicated than that. This is the proposal of uh, Townsend Peterson in the canonical ecological niche modeling framework in which we consider with attention every step and we do our best to carefully take 
every decision. So here, the decision of which occurrence data, which points are we going to use, we inspect everything carefully. We also identify the best environmental variables that we need to use based on the biology of my uh, disease system. And then we explore the algorithm that is most suitable for us to the question. Or maybe we explore different algorithms until we identify the best that uh, fits to the data and our uh, assumptions. So we are going to go over this um, in, in the future in a practical session. And now for the study design, something that we you are going to see a lot in ecological niche modeling is the band diagram presented by Soberon and Peterson in 2005 in the journal Biodiversity Informatics, in which we have three components, the biotic, here in green, the abiotic variables here, and the movement or dispersal capacity. So let's imagine I want to model this carnivore. This is a very rare species in the neotropics. Uh, so I need to take into account, okay, I'm going to study this species in a forest or maybe in a municipality or maybe in a state or maybe in a whole country or maybe in, a, in, in all South America or maybe worldwide, a global analysis. So I need to have clear what's going to be my study area and how can I identify that or define that uh, generally, we consider the capacities of the species to disperse. So that's something we, we, we should uh, understand from our organism. It's a mosquito that flies one kilometer during its entire life, or maybe 20 kilometers. So my study areas are going to be different based on the dispersal capacity of my species. The other one is abiotic. So all the climatic variables, all the soil variables, all the environmental variables that don't change if the species is there or not. For example, temperature. It doesn't matter if the species is there or not. Temperature is going to be always the same. And then we have biotic. So are those variables that change if my species is there? For example, if I'm working with this carnivore, maybe uh, uh, rodents that are prey of my carnivore. If I'm working with mosquitoes, maybe frogs that eat the mosquitoes or bats that eat the mosquitoes, or maybe the reservoirs that for the mosquitoes that the mosquito needs to survive. Maybe the vegetation that is needed for my mosquitoes. But anything that uh, can change fast, especially if my species increases or decreases in, in, in presence. And then we need to understand if it's a global model, for example, uh, if it's a country level model, we need to have that clear based on the biology of my species. In the factors where those uh, variables intersect is where we are going to have the presence of, of these species. So generally, um, we are assuming that these species can have the biotic interactions everywhere where the species is able to uh, disperse. So this dispersal uh, area, we call it the model calibration area in ecological niche modeling, and it's our hunch, our best hypothesis of where these species could occur. So now you have seen this slide before where I have a series of environmental variables which are which I summarize to make this environmental space here in only two dimensions maybe summarizing all these eight dimensions and then I need to have a good idea of okay where is going to be my species do I want to make the model only in this region or all this whole region or all these larger region. So I need to identify that. Um, and for that, I, didn't, I need to know where, where is my data from? How good is my species to disperse? Where do I have barriers? Um, and based on those assumptions is how I identify my study area. Let's imagine that I want to model a bacteria that affects uh, the digestive system of humans. And my analysis needs to be of 
sea waters globally. So I select the whole world and I, I uh, identify sea waters as my study area. So based on my study questions, based on the data I have, and based on my assumptions is how I'm going to identify my study region. Um, here, uh, a more simplistic way is to see the points which we collect from literature, from, from surveillance, the environmental conditions, which are GIS, GIS uh, layers, I'm sorry. Um, and I take this data and I analyze this data in a, in a model, in a software, uh, to have my ecological niche map later. So this analysis here is happening in environmental space, um, but I am doing this analysis with data from the geographic space. So my points here are coordinates, my raster here has coordinates, uh, and maybe I have a bias here because I'm oversampling some regions. So I need to take that into account. Let's imagine I need to, to model this species and I know that uh, an area that the species could colonize is all the, the Midwest of the United States. So I can define that for my species because I have good records. I have um, a lot of experience with this species so I can uh, assume that the species could uh, disperse here in this in this uh, square here. But what happens if I am not sure about my species, how good the species could be to disperse? So in that, those cases, I use biogeographic barriers, like uh, barriers of dispersals. Let's imagine I can use uh, walls, uh, I'm sorry, mountains that are a wall for the dispersal that don't allow the species to disperse. Maybe, maybe rivers, because we know that the species is not good to disperse across rivers. Maybe deserts, because um, are also natural barriers or maybe ice. Uh, and for that, let's have this example. This is a carnivore uh, from Central Africa, uh, and I need, a, I need to make a model of this, this species. So what should be my study area here? Um, should it be the whole world, I like a global model? Should it be uh, all, the whole uh, continent of Africa? or maybe just the Congo Basin. What's, what's, what do you think here? If I model the species uh, globally, I am also predicting all these areas here in the Americas and Asia as potential areas suitable for the species. So it depends on what is my study question because maybe I actually want to know where zoos can have these species. So I can make a map and say, okay, in this condition, in these areas, in these countries, zoos can have these, these species in display without need of having um, sophisticated uh, controlled environments, for example. So it depends on what's my study question, right? Where can my species invade? Then I can do a, a model like this, but if I'm interested only in the ecology of my species in the native range, I focus only on the Congo Basin. Here I have another example of this the Delphis, which is another carnivore. And here I want to show you that I have three species here, one, two, and three. And these three species uh, disperse differently. So I selected the study areas based on geographic barriers, uh, like a river here, the Amazon River, and also the Andes Mountains here. So with that, I develop my models, and now I have potential distributions of my species uh, uh, here in, in their um, M hypothesis or their cali model calibration areas. This is another example. Uh, uh, here I'm modeling bats, where bats occur. I wanted to model bats in Chile. Uh, but I know that in the north, we have the Atacama Desert that is large, it's super dry, uh, it's a natural barrier. The species cannot cross easily this area here in the Atacama Desert, for example. 
And I'll also know that in the south, we have the ice fields of the Patagonia. So it's very cold. The species cannot move there a lot. Also here in the west, I have the ocean, the Pacific Ocean. So I know that my species cannot move from here. So I have a natural barrier here in the south, here uh, the ocean in the west, and in the north, I have the desert. But in the east, I know that all this line here corresponds to the uh, Andes region. So here you can see all the Andes, uh, which is another barrier for the species to cross. So in the end, I end with this area of central Chile, where I actually have points of my species, occurrences of my species, and I use these occurrences to make my models. Um, we know that uh, there is a study showing that more you increase your study area, less uh, uh, robust is your model. So we want to have the smallest study area possible based on how much we know our species. Uh, species response, for example, to temperature in a Gaussian way, like a normal curve, it doesn't matter the species, generally they have this response. So having that in mind, that they have this physiological response to variables. If we have one variable uh, is one a normal curve, if we have several uh, variables, we have an, an ellipsoid. So with that, we need to keep in mind that we are trying to replicate an ellipsoid when we are modeling a, a fundamental ecological niches of a species. Some of them are going to be used by a species, like this blue area is where we see the species. White areas here mean that we don't have those climates on Earth. So uh, uh, there is no place on Earth with these climates. So that's why we don't have, we have the empty pieces here of the niche. And then we have areas in red that are areas that the species could invade or colonize in the future. Are part of the niche, but the species is not using that part of the fundamental niche. It's only using these blue areas that are the realized niche. So that was everything for the model design. Uh, see you soon.